It is a great honor to be joined by David L. Bernstein. He is the founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values and is the author of a new book called Woke Anti-Semitism. How are you today, David? Great of you to join the show. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, I should say that um, you share uh, the same first and last name as the uh, Professor David E. Bernstein of George Mason, who wrote another book uh, last year called Classified about racial classification. Yeah, we, we are friends and we also get confused probably on average about twice a week. <laughs> oh, wow. yes, uh, I should know that. You should know that I'm having him on this uh, very show uh, in the coming few days. So. Oh, wonderful. Good. He's a, he, it's a very good book and a very important book. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so first, I would like to begin by asking you about the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. Why did you establish it and what is its founding mission? Yeah, so I've been a lifelong Jewish professional executive. I've been doing Jewish advocacy work, mostly in the progressive realm, mostly with center-left causes and so forth. So supporting issues like immigrant rights and criminal justice reform and church-state separation and reproductive rights and the like. Um, what happened is, particularly after George Floyd, but it was sort of reaching a crescendo before then as well, um, the space became unbearably ideological for me. I, I just started to feel that um, that a new an ideology. Some people will call it woke ideology, although that's a term that's become very, very controversial recently. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, had sort of taken over many institutions in American life, including many Jewish organizations. And I felt like I could no longer make an impact in that work. And I felt like um, I that we needed to push back against this encroaching ideology. So I founded the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values to try to restore the principles of classical liberalism, that is the free expression of ideas in Jewish life, and also to warn people that this ideology was giving rise to a new variant of anti-Semitism and that it was important to recognize that and to start uh, organizing ourselves to oppose it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we'll get to your book shortly, but um, i like to... Um, examine the how you know woke began to take on the meaning as it is today the word um, you know I think before 2016 I'm um, excluding the uh, I guess the culture uh, cultural milieu which it was formed um, woke basically means the past tense of wake right like I woke up this morning mm -hmm. but I remember it, it was in 2016 where the word became known to the mainstream uh, culture. Um, I remember there was that song by uh, Childish Gambino, uh, Redbone. Mm -hmm. That's the refrain that says, stay woke. And at that yeah. time, it means uh, being conscious of certain ways in which, um, you know, uh, forces and system oppress certain peoples. But it was only a mere six years later that the word became a term of derision. Like those who those who carry or those who believe in woke ideology wouldn't call themselves that that way. They would they would call themselves like fighters for social justice or whatnot. So I'd like to hear your views on how this term evolved into what it means today. Yeah, I think you captured it pretty well. I like the way you described it in its original form, that it means awareness of certain systemic injustices. The issue, though, is, and we needed a word to capture the larger ideological phenomena is that um, when people say I'm aware of systemic injustices, they're making a claim of certainty. They're saying because of my of my standing as a person who's been oppressed, who has lived experience where I can see these supposedly invisible systems of oppression, I'm able to articulate what they mean for the rest of society. And therefore, you should defer to my perception of those of those systematic inequities. And I think that that's where we get off the, the rails. It's not that we shouldn't all be uh, struggling and wrestling with the possible causes of disparities and we should look into possible injustice as well. The injustices exist in systems, including in the American system. It's that we shouldn't, we should be able to openly talk about those and discuss them. And when that became impossible to do because people who were asserting them inserted them with such certainty and made it very difficult to challenge any 
position on that because of their lived experience, that's when it became an ideology, it became a dogma. And that's what we're pushing back against here because that dogma has spread in institutions across American life and institutions across Western countries as well, other Western countries. And I think um, I think that's problematic. And it also, by the way, sparks a reaction on the far right, which I think is disturbing and problematic as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, I would um, second your position in that I do not think it's illegitimate to question um, you know, the way that certain system or the system that we live in operate and how it excludes certain people and marginalizes um, certain peoples. Um, but I I worry that this, this is um, ideology that grows out this, um, I guess, attitude or mentality that is calcifying discourse and it's yes. uh, punishing heterodox thinking. Yes, exactly. I like the way you said question. I think questioning is the right stance, not mm -hmm. asserting with certainty. And that's the difference between having a position that's open for discussion and having an ideology which is closed to discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, the book, Woke Antisemitism, uh, has a foreword, which is, was written by Natan Sharansky. I hope I'm pronouncing his, his name right. Yes, um, perfectly. So, um, I think for those who do not know who uh, Mr. Shransky was, uh, is uh, why don't you tell us who he is and how did you manage to get him to write you a forward? Yeah, Natan Sharansky was probably the greatest refusenik, that is, the, a person that who was, uh, was refused uh, emigration to, to Israel from the former Soviet Union. He was a hero of the resistance, and he spent nine years in the gulag, um, for uh, for speaking out and for uh, being a champion of the Refusenik Jews. Um, and then um, I think it was in maybe 1987, I could be mistaken, when he was released from the former Soviet Union, released from jail and came to Israel and became a leading light in the Jewish world. Um, he became an Israeli politician. He led the Jewish agency and so forth. And he's written several amazing books. Um, I've known Sharansky, and I also knew um, that Sharansky had great concerns over the rise of what we'll call, still call woke ideology until someone comes up with a better term that everyone understands. We can call it radical social justice ideology or something else if you wish. Um, so, But Sharansky saw in that ideology echoes of totalitarianism in the form of Soviet Union. He pointed out that that the binary ideology that used to focus on class and the like in the Soviet Union was now focused on culture and ethnicity and, um, and that um, and that you know it was doing similar things to the discourse as the totalitarian totalizing ideology of his youth. So uh, Sharansky had great concerns and was very worried about how that ideology might fuel anti-Semitism. And of course, that's where I where I come down as well. So we had made common cause and talked, and we had him on a couple of live stream events. And um, I knew who to ask when I wanted a forward to the book. I see. Well, um, I should say that Natan Sharansky is a hero to you and I both, and should be one to any and all listeners who examine who would examine his life. Um, so my next question is: um, Do you share um, Natan Sharansky's views that? Um, woke ideology, and I think uh, for the remainder of this this talk, we can use that as the uh, term for what we are describing. Um, do, we, do you share the notion that woke ideology has the same totalitarian bent that, uh, I guess, um, Soviet Marxism does? Yeah, so the thing Sharansky will point out is that no one will disappear you in the United States for your words and so forth. So I think it, he's right to point out that while there are similarities in the ideological architecture of wokeism and totalitarian uh, and, and Marxism, totalitarian Marxism in the Soviet Union, they don't have the same consequences because we still live in a democratic society in the United States that are protected by certain freedoms, the First Amendment and the like. So I don't think it's exactly the same because it's not it's not spreading in the same kind of society that the Soviet Union was. Um, so I so I but I do share his belief that it has many of the same properties um, and that it is um, it is a totalizing ideology in that way. 
and that it borrows heavily from Marxist thought. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so um, how would a believer in woke ideology view, I guess, society in general and race relations in particular in your characterization? Um, well, I think that they would um, they would see American society and probably other Western societies as being funda fundamentally oppressive to uh, marginalized communities, minorities. Um, they they tend to look at the world through this sort of oppressed oppressor binary. Um, now they'll say, well, in the intersectional worldview, one can be both an oppressor and oppressed, and I suppose that's true. But the fact is that once you once you link identity to privilege or oppression in the way they do. So a white person is automatically an oppressor or privileged. A black person is automatically oppressed. Um, a man is automatically the oppressor. A woman is automatically the oppressed. Cis is automatically the oppressor. Um, you know, um, gender nonconforming is automatically oppressed. When you have such an inflexible and rigid way of labeling identity, it's very easy to see how that can go off the rails as, as it has been. Um, I think it's terrible for race relations because mm -hmm. I think it it it, it makes um, both white people and black people feel resentful toward each other rather than to see the possibilities of a collaborative society, of um, the possibility of making America live up to its own high ideals. Um, the uh, great uh, writer and critic, uh, Albert Murray, called American society um, based on, a, on the antagonistic cooperation. I think that's a very important idea. It leaves the possibility of cooperation, even when there are sort of lingering antagonisms that come from our, our history. If this ideology sort of inflates those into gargantuan obstacles and claims that any any uh, remaining discrimination must be evidence of pervasive oppression. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're if you're a young African American being acculturated that way, you're less likely to see America as a place of opportunity. And a white person is more likely to start, to, especially white people, by the way, who live under less than ideal con conditions, as many do. I mean, many white people are facing tough times as well. If you go to like Appalachia and some of the parts of the United States where the manufacturing sector has deserted them decades ago and there's an opioid epidemic and the like, and they're told then that they're privileged because of their white skin, Again, that breeds resentment. It doesn't breed good relations. And I think this is the wrong social model for America and the West. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I think in my understanding, um, what it has become known as woke ideology shares a lot of, uh, I guess, philosophical insights with um, the neo-Marxist Frankfurt School, as well as the French uh, postmodernists in that they view they view the, the world through not a lens of... Uh, not through the lens of objective truth, but through a lens of various interest groups vying for power, and and um, you know each individual can be both the uh, oppressor or exerting power over another, as well as the oppressed, as in being exerted power too. Um, so my question now would be: How does this um, present a challenge to classical liberal values? Yeah, because it it in the words of Wesley Yang uh, becomes a quote unquote successor ideology. Um, in other words, it it liberalism and liberal values are not a political position that one takes. It's an operating system. It's not an app. It's an operating system. It, it's so our societies, Western societies, are based on the ability for people to sort of hash things out, to disagree, hopefully agreeably, sometimes not so agreeably, but to have arguments and debates. Um, in an open, relatively open environment, um, and um, and so that so I, I worry, and I think that woke ideology, as uh, or as uh, Wesley Yang puts it, successor ideology, makes it has a completely different operating system, or as the the the, the word in philosophy would be epistemology. It's <laughs> arguing that the that it's not through argument, debate, and inquiry that we've get closer to the truth, but rather by 
by sort of equalizing the ine power inequities that we do so. So what it seeks to do is silence certain voices that it deems have dominant and to, um, and to platform other voices that it seems that it believes have they've marginalized. And through that process, get closer to the truth because it doesn't see truth as, as objective as you point out, but rather as relative. Um, so um, it's trying to equal the playing field um, by 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 exalting certain voices and downgrading others. And I think that's fundamentally problematic. I don't think that's how you solve problems. I don't think that's how you overcome obstacles or legacies. I think you do that by an open discussion. It's not perfect. Liberalism is not a is not a miracle drug for society. It's just the best that humans can do. And um, and I don't think that that the successor ideology will will get us there. In fact, I think it'll do the exact opposite of what it pretends to to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, now let us uh, dive into the uh, that other challenge to liberalism, and that is anti-Semitism. Um, I think uh, if you read uh, Barry Weiss's short monograph, which she written a few years ago, 2019, I believe, mm -hmm. in the wake of that disastrous um, shooting at her Pittsburgh synagogue, how to fight anti-Semitism, that would be the title. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. She she posits that um, the anti-Semitism um, transcends the, I guess, the garden variety prejudicial attitude, say, uh, you don't want your daughter to marry a Jewish man, or you don't want to sit in the same restaurant that a Jewish person would eat. But it is a umbrella of ideas, and all of them are pernicious, and, you know, it and I think the it always starts with the idea that um, Jewish people are in control of everything and they make our lives worse. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I mean, anti-Semitism is very different from other forms of racism or prejudice in that it doesn't hold the Jew in contempt for being uh, incompetent or um, being less than, but rather it whole, it tends to, and it's not all anti-Semitism is the same, tends to sort of lift up the Jew as some kind of uh, all-powerful figure. Anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory that tends to be nested in larger conspiracy theories of the world. So in the case of, let's say, the great replacement theory that, um, that uh, ordinary Americans are being replaced by um, immigrants, um, the Jew becomes the mythical figure in the background that's helping facilitate the immigration and the replacement of white people. Um, so again, it's a it's a conspiracy theory that uh, about Jews that's part of a much larger conspiracy theory in American society. And I think I think you could argue that woke ideology functions similarly to the Great Replacement Theory. It's a, it's a theory of power and who has it and who doesn't. And in this, it, it empowers the idea that Jews are a privileged class within um, within a very binary oppressed oppressor society. I think the same about um, Islamism and Islamic ideologies, radical Islamic ideologies, which uh, view the Jew as the infidel. But it's not just the Jew in the Muslim or radical Muslim imagination, it's the idea that the West writ large is trying to oppress the Muslim world. So I think th that's how we have to understand anti-Semitism. Um, and anti-Semitism tends to sort of remain in control when society and liberal values are more or less, you know, dominant. But when when liberal values in society are challenged in the way they have by conspiracy theories, by simplistic explanations, by dogmas, that provides fertile ground for these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And I think that's what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way I see it, the um, the woke version of anti-Semitism and the Islamist version of anti-Semitism, they, they have a lot of overlap in them uh, in that both are very critical of Western society and both are, I would say, equally contemptuous of Jewish life. And of course, the Jewish nation state, which is Israel. Um, um, so I guess my my assessment, my question now is, um, so in your characterization, um, how does uh, woke ideology view the Jewish people? Yeah, look, I think that there are gradations of woke like there are everything else. You know, there's sort of the hardcore neo-Marxist people who, um, who really want to, um, you know, upend American society and Western societies and, and so forth. 
And maybe those are the people who are uh, responsible for spreading the ideology in universities. I think there's um, a less lethal, but still problematic form um, of the ideology, which, um, you know, you see in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, you know, trainings around the country in the corporate sector. And these are people who are not trying to upend American society. They're, these are people in some ways who are just trying to integrate this into the capitalist framework. So it's not like um, they're the same kind of threat, but one grows from the other. And um, and so I would say that the anti-Semitism also is, uh, is different depending on where it comes from. If it comes from that sort of hard left neo-Marxist core, it's going to be very explicit. It's going to see um, Zionism as a form of settler colonialism that that depopulated the Palestinians and um, and it will characterize Zionism and Jewish power as as genocidal in nature, um, and so um, that's one form of it. I think that the softer form of wokeism or that you see in anti-racism and DEI um, also though conditions people to think in this oppressor-oppressor binary. And it's more likely that people will, will be insensitive to Jewish narratives because they'll see Jews as permanently part of the power establishment and as, as quote unquote white. So um, that so that's what I think it's doing. It's it's not that it's that that softer form is inherently anti-Semitic, but it rather em enables a form of anti-Semitism in that it it pushes an ideology that almost inevitably will lead to a certain perception of Jews. Um, I should uh, visit the question of how does the how does woke ideology uh, view non-Western cultures and. I think um, by that I should mention that um, in my four years of university, um, um, I think um, apart from the sociology class, nobody really reads Foucault, but a text that is wildly popular among students of every department is Orientalism by Edward Said. Sure. I, I think that book is probably provides the fundamentals, the foundations for how, I guess, uh, woke ideology views non-Western cultures. So if mm -hmm. you, I think, assuming you know about uh, Said and Orientalism I, better I than myself, certainly do. how I would you, uh, better than you. How, would you, how would you characterize that, uh, his framework? Yeah, so I think, you know, Said articulated the post-colonialist uh, ideology that, you know, that Western countries in the West were having embraced um, oppressive discourses toward non-Western societies, right? And that, um, and and so it became a fundamental text for those who felt similarly. And, you know, you'll read it in every kind of, you know, ethnic studies class and the like. So um, I think that that's, um, that, that eventually gave rise to sort of the domestic form of post-colonialism, which is wokeism. In other words, it start. I think these ideologies as oppressor of oppressed ideologies were much more popular in Western Europe than they were in the United States for a long time. Like in the late 1980s, when I was a college student, I rarely came across somebody that ideological who viewed the world in those terms. American liberals tend to just believe that they were have and have nots, and we have to do our best to have the have nots. Um, but in, when I would meet European college students and the like, I realized that they had really embraced this post-colonialist uh, ideology and and so th so I always thought that if the United States ever embraced post-colonialism, if the left in the United States did, we were going to face very harsh realities, um, especially Jews. Um, and and the answer is we have, um, but it also has has gone further in some ways than Western Europe because in Western Europe, it, while it's a description of how the West has oppressed certain countries, now that same framework has sort of become the dominant way of looking at relations between different races, ethnicities, genders, and the like in American society. I think it's gone much further than post-colonialism ever did in Western Europe. So I think that's the problem now. Not that everybody is equally as um, as ideologically charged as Said and his supporters are in the way that they assert these things. But again, it's been popularized and democratized in a way that I think um, poses real dangers to the uh, well-being and security of American Jews and others and society. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think one of the key tenets of uh, wokeism is 
the way that they view that non-Western cultures are in perpetual danger of being, I guess, co-opted or I guess in their terms, colonialized by the Western cultures. And I think uh, if I'm if I were a someone who believes in that idea, uh, I don't say that, well, it kind of is because um, Hollywood movies are shown everywhere in the world and they, for the most part, surpass the, I guess, gross revenue of their local film, uh, film base, uh, you know, their local cinema cultures, um, maybe except India. Um, and, um, you know, the world speaks English now. Um, everyone has to speak English in order to move around the world somehow. And uh, every history class has taken a distinctively Eurocentric perspective in that it always starts with Europe and then the other countries are mentioned in relation to the European continent. So how would you answer to those, um, I guess, objections, so to speak? Yeah, well, one thing I would point out is in this uh, supposedly imperialistic American culture that spreads around the world, I think Black Americans are probably the most um, the most successful per capita um, cultural community the world has ever known. I mean, just think about all the cultural capital that comes out of Black Americans, from rap music to various music to uh, to sports figures and the like. Um, these are the most. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that there's no inequities in the United States that are aimed at Black people. There are, but it but it shows how how uh how it's not american culture is not just eurocentric in nature i mean it, if you consider black american pop culture as eurocentric i guess you could if you wanted to um then go ahead but that but that's one of the things that it's uh that it's, it's spreading around the world as well um so um i think it's much more complicated than that i think america has been you know has produced culture that is popular that is viral in nature that um that that spreads and people want it and they like it and so forth. So it, it's sort of the, th the thing about it is it sort of in, implies that there's a lack of agency on the part of the people who are turned on by it, you know. And I've been to other countries in the world where I see how popular American culture is and can be a little bit embarrassing at times. But I also know that they want it. I mean, you know, it's not like that they don't that they that they can't think for themselves. They want it. No one is shoving it down their throats. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a there's an appeal to it, and maybe that's because the United States got there first. In some ways, maybe the West got there first um, for a variety of reasons that you can you can read about, and and that makes the the West a dominant cultural framework. I understand that. That doesn't mean it's imperialistic in nature, although it has been and can be. Um, it, it it can mean that si simply the, um, that some Western that some Western media, some Western ideas are are powerful. The, I, you know, one other Western export is sort of the idea of democracy, for example, that it has liberated millions of people in parts of the world that uh, have been formerly oppressed. So, again, I, I think you have to look at it in, in its wholeness and not and not just treat American or Western culture as as imperialistic in nature. I think it's also liberatory as well. Yes. Um, I think one thing I worry about is that. Um... As uh, woke ideology begins to take hold of American culture, uh, soon enough it will be an export with the same sort of virality that as other like Hollywood movies about democracy goes. So uh, I think um, I think uh, I would say that uh, tackling wokeism would be like doing the world a favor, not just uh, doing the U.S. of A a favor. But um, I would like to move on to what what I see to be the two central pillars of wokeism um so i'll focus on the first one being intersectionality and um, i i suppose uh i suppose uh in the mainstream culture i guess wokeism uh adapts a pretty much watered down version of intersectionality theory but the yeah. way i understand it is that um, in a pluralistic society um depends on who you are you can face uh, multiple layers of prejudice, not just one. Uh, for example, a black woman faces two layers of prejudice in a, I guess, white dominant society, as opposed to a black man who faces only one. And if you add the, I guess, homosexual or queer into it, 
then you have three layers of prejudice. But what I see the woke uh, version of the intersectional framework, what I find to be troubling is that uh, be, from that, they start to build a hierarchy of oppression. Uh, and uh, in that particular hierarchy, um, I think Barry Weiss uh, explains it really well. If you're Brad Pitt and John Hamm, you're at the bottom and therefore your voice is not deferred to as much. But if you are a uh, black trans disabled woman uh, from a very poor area, then you are automatically on the top of the oppression hierarchy and everybody should defer to you when speaking about your experience. So um, would you agree with that characterization? Yeah, I, I do agree with that characterization. Look, the idea of intersectionality may have had some utility, right? A lot of what you see that comes out of sort of postmodern thought and wokeness is it could be a useful lens if it saw itself as just being a useful lens. But it, in, instead, it sees itself as providing like a, a complete explanatory framework, an axiom. And I think when a heuristic becomes an axiom, then you're in trouble. And so you have this heuristic of intersectionality, which, as you said, can, shows that some, something that might be true, that if you're if you have multiple forms of disadvantage, that those are that has a certain compound effect and the sum is greater than um, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So I think that that I, I think that that can be true. And yet it's not always true. And it's not always true that being black is a disadvantage and being white is an advantage. Or that, and it's not always true that being black gives you some insight into oppression and the whiteness gives you some you know, blindness to oppression. And, and, and so when you start to map it out on a hierarchy of privilege, as you say, you end up with these just complete absurdities. It's very rigid in nature. And it, it tries to empower certain voices and to stifle others. And I think that's why we should we should be very care, we should be very wary of it and and oppose it as a as an ideological framework. Um, again, and uh, you see other manifestations of this as well. You see groups like let's say um, victims of rape violence joining forces with the most radical voices within Black Lives Matter to join the anti-Israel boycott, divestment, and sanctions cause, all in the name of intersectionality. So somehow intersectionality has ceased being just sort of this idea that certain identities uh, give one either greater sources of privilege and oppression, but rather are, is a framework for the uniting of oppressed groups against some singular oppressive force in the world. And I think that becomes even more problematic and in another way that the ideology is sort of amplified. Mm -hmm. um, so the second pillar, which I um, uh, can perceive, is uh, what we would call critical race theory, um, or at least uh, in the woke um, in the woke mindset, it would be a pretty watered down version of CRT, so to speak. Sure. But um, I think the way I perceive it is it's uh, is that the the CRT lens dictate that you uh, are. Uh, you are not a you know, an individual, rather you're defined by your race. Um, and your race is defined by, I guess, uh, uh, history. Mm, uh, so that means um, the the New York Times' 1619 project is a huge uh, boon for the CRT framework because it shows a history in which... Um, um, you know, blacks are perpetually enslaved by whites. And so um, if you are a white person, then you are you know, by nature, you know, s someone who oppresses black people. And if you're black, then you, know, you are you are perpetually in oppression of, by whites and you should always watch your step. So um, I guess uh, well, do you agree with that characterization? And if so, uh, how does this, uh, how does this, uh, I guess, detrimental to race relations? Yeah. So, um, John, the great social psychologist Jonathan Haidt once said that uh, critical race theory is cuckoo, and by that he doesn't mean that it's crazy, like, uh, but it is, it is like the cuckoo bird who kicks out, who goes into another bird's nest and kicks out all its eggs and takes it over. 
<laughs> and uh, in some ways, the critical race theory, because of its undermining epistemology, it, it's its claim to have to have a monopoly on insight about race and racism, tends to crowd out other views and says that there's no other acceptable explanation for why there's disparity in the world than oppression. In other words, there could be no other way of looking at it. There can be no other. So rather than being a potentially useful lens, or I'll just say a useful lens at times that one can deploy when one tries to understand disparity, I can say, okay, I'm looking at disparity in a um, in a in a black community and a nearby white community. Uh, maybe one factor of systemic racism. I'd like to sort of analyze that. Um, I, I'm stuck with that as the only factor. Um, because it, it claims that any other analysis, any cultural analysis, um, any economic analysis really are subordinate to the dominant, you know, critical race framework. So I think that that's, uh, that's, that doesn't help us solve problems and it's bad for race relations. So let me give you an example of this. Recently, a very prominent, um, progressive rabbi tweeted out that, um, that black women uh, were dying in childbirth at three times the rate of white women and that that is evidence of systemic racism. Now that's the kind of thing you hear all the time in this discourse, right? That you, you, hear, you hear a disparity and you immediately default to systemic racism. But it turned out that the University of North Carolina um, had done some research recently on this and found out that black women were much more likely to experience hypertension than white women for a variety of reasons. And that uh, as a result, um, they were dying in childbirth at three times the rate of white women. And um, and if you treated them for their hypertension, you could actually narrow that to practically zero. And yet, if you're so fixated on the single explanation for disparity, you miss these other alternative explanations that might actually give you clues into how to overcome the disparities. And I worry that that's what we've done. We've adopted a lens. It may not be critical race theory in the way it was being taught in you know, Harvard Law School, but, um, but you've adopted a lens about systemic oppression that is an outgrowth of critical race theory that then tells you exactly how you have to see the world. So that's bad for... Uh, that's bad for sort of social progress because it, it gives you only one explanation when almost every phenomenon that we can think of is multifactorial. And it's bad for race relations because it leads some people to suggest that the system is rigged against them and therefore they have less agency and therefore they're more likely to face downward, mo downwardly mobile pressures in society. So mm -hmm. I think that it's, um, and, and then it, it, it leads people to think that other they're constantly oppressed and others are the oppressors. And that's just no way to have a, uh, an interracial conversation in a society. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, if you are, if you do adapt the intersectional critical race framework, then I think one of the things that you would conclude about, I, I guess, Jewish people, and I guess this is my, just uh, a characterization, it's not my true beliefs, is that, well, you are not what you say you are in that, well, you say you are oppressed and you say you have, you know, you are suffering from multiple prejudices, but, well, look at all the prominent figures in uh, banking, academia, media, culture, et cetera. Every one of them is Jewish. And, you know, if, and the, the radical take on it would be Kanye West, who even before his like weird tirade, he always alleges that, um, well, these uh, Jewish uh, record executives are you know, taking money from black artists and whatnot. And so the woke uh, anti-Semite view, so to speak, would say that, well, you say you are oppressed and you say you are, you know, like us, but you are uh, occupying prominent positions and therefore you are you are in charge of the system. Um, and secondly, um, and this, there's some truth to it in that, well, for example, in, in Hollywood movies of old, uh, you have a lot of um, Jewish uh, people being studio executives and yet depictions of say, Black people and Asian people and even Native Americans are still are considered very problematic to today. And secondly, I would say that, well, you say that you believe in liberalism. You say you uh, stand up for the weak, uh, the oppressed, the have-nots. But yet, here you go. When you're in these positions, well, you don't really do anything. In fact, sometimes you even 
try to you know screw us over so how would you i guess respond to that challenge well first of all like you know there are there are not jews who are not very nice i mean you know there are there are jews in every single field who are extremely generous i mean if you look if you look at like jews give more philanthropy per capita than any ethnic or religious community by far it's not even close and i don't mean just the jewish philanthropies they give more to hospitals and cancer research and 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 social justice causes and everything else so uh, um so writ large it's just not true but that doesn't mean that there aren't some mean-spirited jews in hollywood and banking and you know who do bad things to people who are even oppressive in their behavior but that doesn't reflect on all Jews. It just means that there are certain people who've gotten very successful and have allowed their power to go to their head and, and the like. And that should be very normal. You know, in some ways, the fact that Jews are so prominent in certain industries is because they were originally discriminated against. So they founded new industries. They founded new ways of being successful. You know, they were dis discriminated against in certain kinds of law. So they went into other forms of law where they became dominant, you know, and that's why... Um, Jews were pulled into sort of the cultural fields and, and the like, just like, by the way, gay people as well in America. So I think it's, you know, and if you you could do the same kind of analysis of gay people in, in, in the arts, for example, and say, oh, look at how oppressive they've been toward others, when obviously gay people are in the arts because they were originally discriminated against. Um, I, I think, you know, going back to your, 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 your original point about this is that, you know, of course, oppression can be can prevent people from succeeding. I mean, you know, and I, I think that you couldn't say that, oh yeah, black people had opportunities be, uh, because they were oppressed in Jim Crow America. I mean, yeah, some people were able to get around it, but not very many people were able to get around it. And, um, and so that's always been the case that there were exceptions to the oppression in society. But there are times when discrimination, depending on how serious it is, how pervasive it is, can also be uh, a source of, of, of power and enabling groups. They, 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 they find ways of succeeding in the system anyway. And, um, and I think that that's Jews in many countries around the world, but not always, depending on how oppressive that society actually was. Mm. I would, I'd like to move on to how uh, the state of Israel is being uh, viewed under this um, Woke uh, CRT lens, and one thing that really surprises me is how you know. I guess you mentioned the the people who believe in the uh, Black Lives Matter, I guess framework framework of ideology. They they look at the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians the same way that they view the I guess uh, the conflict between I guess Black and White America, um, but but you know. Uh, not knowing the fact that the history between the two regions are vastly different. So you just grab one worldview and just uh, and adapt it to another very distant place. Yeah. yeah. I think that's absolutely true. And you can really feel this in May 2021 when there was a round of conflict between Israel and Hamas and Gaza. Now, as someone who's been in the Jewish professional world my entire life, I, I've been tracking that conflict between Israel and Hamas and Gaza since 2008, when you had the first rounds of it, um, of you know rocket fire and bombings, and then there were tunnels, and then there were there were kites and the like. Um, and the usual trajectory in the U.S. media was that the first few days, the the mainstream media gave Israel the benefit of the doubt. Israel was being attacked; they had the right to defend itself. But as casualties mounted. Um, Israel started to become accused of disproportionate force, and then there were calls to end the conflict. That was the normal trajectory. But in 2021, you could really feel the difference in how much America had been sort of, or certainly the American elite, the media elite, had been sitting in this ideological ferment. And um, and immediately Israel was cast into the role of the oppressor. There was no benefit of the doubt and the early days of those conflict, and you could really feel it on social media. And so that's really when um, when woke ideology came for Israel, when it um, when it 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 changes the views of ordinary Americans, particularly those with a liberal bent, and has them think in terms of these oppressed oppressor binaries. It's very easy to shoehorn Israel into the oppressed in that oppressor binary. Never mind that Israelis are extremely ethnically diverse. 
Never mind, by the way, that among the most right wing Israelis are the among uh, among the most traditionally discriminated against. You know, it's the um, the, the the white quote unquote white European establishment, the Ashkenazi establishment in Israel that's considered within Israeli society as the oppressor, and the um, the Mizrahi, the Jews from the from the Middle East and, of course, from, you know, places like Ethiopia that are considered the oppressed, yet they're the, the ones who are most likely to be pushing for, you know, strong action against uh, Palestinians and against Hamas in a war. So you see how we're taking an ideology that doesn't make very much sense on the American scene, and we're applying it in a way that's completely distortive of what's going on in Israel and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find that this, um, I guess, binary oppressor oppressed framework contribute to how the Israel Palestine conflict being like capturing so much of the world's attention? Where, whereas in the world, there are countless other land disputes. Uh, I'm thinking just one Indian Pakistan, which l lots and lots more lives are at stake, but you know, news are. In, the I guess American English language news are not very much paying attention to that, but yeah, Palestine. Yeah, I think it's one factor, and it's certainly become more salient in recent years with as wokeness has sort of set in. But that's been around for a long time, and I think that there are other factors as well. I mean, part of it might be sort of the antecedent to uh, to wokeness, which was post-colonial ideology had already seeped into mainstream American media outlets to a degree too. So they were using that framework to a degree to analyze what was going on. But another one is sort of maybe the, a, a religious framework is that in the, you know, the popular imagination of, of Israel and Jews being the light into the nations and, um, and, and of course, the history that Jews were victims of the Nazi Holocaust and then came to found a land of their own. Were they now doing to the Palestinians what the Nazis had done to the Jews? Again, you had all these various narratives that sort of, uh, tr you know, combine into this perfect storm of narratives that that elevate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into sort of the world's paradigmatic oppressor versus oppressive conflict and get it entirely wrong in the process. Yeah, and I think the both the woke anti-Semitic view as well as the Islamic anti-Semitic view, I um, think they share in their, I guess, disregard for the Jewish historical claim to that part of the, um, I guess, the land of Israel. Um, if you're, if you're, say, an Islamist, uh, Islamist anti-Semite, you would say that well, Israel is not a legitimate state because it was, uh, it popped up out of nowhere because the Europeans felt guilty about um, the Holocaust and other crimes they committed against the Jews, and now we, the Arabs, uh, the Muslims, have to, I guess, shoulder that burden. And the woke view would be that well, much of the land, much of the state of Israel is formed by immigrants, uh, people who are refugees from Europe or from Soviet Russia, and they cause the and, the and the Middle East, by the way. Of course, yes, and uh, and they um, they usurp the lands and the properties of um, of uh, the Arabs who has, had been staying there for centuries and centuries and drove them out the land. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that would be an act of uh, usurpation. So I guess that would be yeah. the way I view it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's true. I think the Islamist worldview, though, goes a step further. It views this blot of the state of Israel in the middle or the heart of the Ummah, which is, you know, the, um, the Islam, Islamic sovereignty. And so in a way, like Jews were always the thimmi, the second class citizens of Muslim worlds, and they were tolerated as such for a long time. But when Jews become a powerful, they also sort of point to the failures of the Muslim world too. Why hasn't, why haven't countries that are majority Muslim done better than they have? Why have they been surpassed by the West? So, well, okay, one way you could look at it as the Arab Human Rights Report did that came out of the United Nations years ago, do it is that say there's been a failure of the part of Arab elites. They they haven't really embraced 
you know, Western democracy, they become very corrupt and the like. And as a result, they've sold out the possibility of democracy in the Arab world. And, and that democracy is hard to do, by the way. Um, and, um, and, and then, and therefore, market economies, successful, vibrant market economies, which are largely based on democratic processes, are also hard to do. But they then, uh, they instead they say, well, no, it's that those countries are pressing us. They're keeping us down. They're the reason why we're not more successful. And, and then you have this Jewish state in the heart of the Ummah, in the heart of uh, Muslim territory, as they would see it, um, just sort of pointing the finger at them and reminding them on an ongoing basis of what it can be like when you have a group of people who who's, who who succeed, who who embrace democratic values, and I hope they'll continue to embrace democratic values, and who embrace uh, modern economic practices and innovation and so forth, and allow women to have freedom and allow gay people to have freedom. Th that that's what it produces. It produces an energetic country that's highly successful, that puts out more Nobel Prize winners than the entire Arab world combined, that's way, way bigger than it. That's what it produces. So it's it's a source of humiliation as well. <laughs> and I think uh, I think we should focus on the, I guess, the response to wokeism. And the way I see it, there uh, there's a parallel phenomenon in that in America, um, certain prominent, I guess, anti-woke warriors, I'm thinking of two, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida and the Manhattan Institute fellow and his current aide, uh, Christopher Rufo, who has been the most uh, prominent voice in the battle against woke ideology, but their crucial error is that they are willing to discard liberal values in order to, to do so. And also in Israel, um, according to the news sources I've read anyways, um, it is seeing the most right-wing government since the time of its founding. Uh, you have uh, the figure of Itamar Ben-Gavir, the radical right uh, you know, politician who's uh, occupying a senior post in that Netanyahu government. And I can see that the the rightward drift of Israeli government and I'm assuming society in general is due to the fact that they have been so beleaguered by the constant attacks from Hamas and as well as the disillusionment of the I guess uh, the insolvency of the conflict with the Palestinians. So there are these two responses which are both illiberal in nature, and they are in response to one uh, illiberal force, even violent force after another. So uh, how can how can us uh, liberals uh, I guess uh, handle this uh, this part of the I guess the war between two illiberal forces? Yeah. So let me. Let me just play devil's advocate for a moment uh, from, let's say, the Chris Rufo school. <laughs> Rufo would say that we're really not ultimately trying to be a liberal. What we're trying to use is the tools of power to restore some sense of, uh, of liberalism. And now the danger, of course, is that that's not what they're going to restore. They're, instead, they're going to restore a new form of illiberalism that comes out of that, that, that favors a right-wing ideology um, rather than favors a left-wing ideology. So I, I believe that that's a, a possibility and a real danger. But he would then say that people like me who write op-eds and um, and write books and make arguments and um, aren't really going to do anything to overturn this leftist illiberal order in American institutions and that we should be more willing to, to use the political tools that are available to us to fight the good fight and to make progress. And that's exactly what's happening in Florida. And I would say my my um, my reaction is that there are the aspects of what DeSantis is doing in Florida are genuinely liberal and troubling, like banning the teaching of critical race theory or banning certain books and the like. But there's some things that he's doing that are also put under that same rubric that aren't necessarily problematic. Like I don't think it's necessarily problematic to um, to ask uh, to to ban the use of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion statements in universities. Um, I'm 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 still thinking through the idea of banning DEI bureaucracies in universities, but that may not be a liberal. That may be within the legitimate powers of the states. And I think that DEI bureaucracies are illiberal. And sometimes when we look at what DeSantis and Rufo are doing, we 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 compare their sense censoriousness, the censorship 
to as if there's a, a liberal order that's on the ground. But I don't think that's the case. I think that in many of these institutions, particularly in higher ed and, and sometimes in K through 12 education, another form of a liberalism is, is set in. Um, so if you're asking me like what's worse, censorship or indoctrination, in other words, would I rather have my 11th grade son um, be banned from teaching Ibrahim X. Kendi, who's, the, you know, one of the chief anti-racist ideologues in the United States, or would I rather him be indoctrinated in him? I would rather it be banned. Now, that's not an excuse to do what, uh, what, what DeSantis is doing and to ban him. What I'd rather him do is learn at Ibram X. Kendi and learn the criticism of Ibram X. Kendi. But I don't want it to be so easy for people just to indict DeSantis without indicting the system in which DeSantis is also trying to upend. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think that um, that's why I, I tend to be, I, I tend to, um, you know, I, I'm trying to ask how, what 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 are the appropriate uses of power to to reestablish liberal ideas, and where does it become inappropriate and cross the line, and what other tools do we have at our disposal? And I do think we have some tools at our disposal um, that are that are not even that political in nature, but, but are just about building critical mass of people within institutions who share liberal values and they're out there to speak up. So there are there are things that we can do. We can build new 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 coalitions and alliances between Asian Americans that also have problems with the current uh, you know illiberal order and Jewish Americans and Black heterodox thinkers and Hispanics and the like. So I think that there are opportunities out there to push back that are just getting started that are in their earlier stages. And I'm very involved in that work and building those new coalitions and what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I'm giving you a bit of a um, a mixed answer uh, there. And in Israel, I agree with you in, to a degree. I mean, I think that there are other factors besides just the failure of the Isra of, of Israel to solve the Palestinian-Israeli question. I think it's also, by the way, Israeli Arabs who, who engaged in violent protests um, a few years ago that really set off the Ben Gavir camp in Israel and empowered it. Um, I think it's dangerous. And I worry that that Israel could go in the wrong direction and become an illiberal, more autocratic state that it could it could really start losing ground. But then again, to watch the reaction of the Israeli public and the um, hundreds of thousands of people who are coming out every single week to protest it, maybe this will lead to a kind of resurgence of Israeli civil society and democracy that will ultimately be healthy or maybe it'll be mixed. So I don't I don't have a crystal ball to look through, but I think that there's promising signs in Israel in the face of these autocratic tendencies that we're seeing from some. Um, I think in the United States, it, um, it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. And I think um, those of us who deem ourselves liberal have to ask ourselves some questions to what degree we should use political power and to what degree should we just you know sit on the sidelines and critique both sides. And that's a real question that we that that we have to think through. <laughs> And of course, um, a note in that um, this podcast is all about uh, mixed answers to very difficult, very like densely worded questions. So it's all what this program is about. Um, so final question. Um, my theory is that the reason why, I guess, liberals have had some trouble fighting woke ideology especially woke anti-Semitism, is that um, I think our greatest strength and weakness lies from the fact that we are humanitarians. I think to be a classical liberal is to be a humanitarian in that we we care about toleration and we, and we protect these values because we believe that they benefit the weak, the have-not, and the oppressed. But because of that, when somebody else comes along and say that Yes, I, we share the same humanitarian goals, but we have a more direct and more radical way of doing it, which is uh, more, uh, I guess, what do you call it, <clears throat> would uh, you yield bigger results quicker and not in an incremental, I guess, uh, fairness fashion. And you mentioned that's why I think a classical liberal institution like uh, the American Civil Liberties Union has been completely taken over by woke ideology. So I think uh, a solution would be to assert that as liberals, we care about the same humanitarian ends that the woke people are doing, but uh, we are not willing to, I guess, abolish certain guardrails or abolish certain norms of 
discourse in order to do so. Uh, yeah. So let me channel let me channel my best Chris Rufo for a second and him saying, yes, I understand that. And yes, you should talk about the humanitarian values that you share. Um, but but the problem is your sharing of those humanitarian values is not going to upend the the power monopoly that um, that sort of woke ideological forces have over certain institutions. Like they said, you mentioned the ACLU mm -hmm. or that you see in the arts or even you see in the military um, in some in some situations, in some places. So it's not like um, it's not like he's saying, great, say that, do that. But but that's not going to go far enough. And and um, and so um, I think that's where the dilemma for us is that, you know, I come not from the sort of world of liberalism. I come from the world of advocacy. And I know that, you know, political force needs to, to a certain degree needs to be met with political force. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Canada right now, wokeism is uh, spreading like wildfire. And in Canada, unlike the United States, there's no Ron DeSantis, there's no opposing political force in Canada that uh, serves as a sort of counterforce to wokeism. Um, and so as a result, um, wokeism has no, no stumbling blocks. It just spreads and spreads and spreads. So I think for liberals like myself, who do not want to see the Chris Rufos of the world or the DeSantis's not only upend um, wokeism, but also install some alternative ideology that is equally liberal, we're at a we're in a very difficult spot because um, we need the opposing political force that's more robust than a good op-ed or a good book or a good essay or whatever in a nice podcast. But we also don't want to go too far in that. And so we're uneasy with the Chris Ruf Rufo campus allies, and we don't, rightly so, by the way, um, so what do we do? How do we navigate those treacherous waters? And that's why I'm sort of um, trying to articulate a framework that that utilizes some of that camp's tools in their toolbox, but not all of them. And trying to see if we can articulate a new approach that uses political politics, that's not afraid of politics, that in, w will challenge it in ways that are consistent with our values, but um, but don't go as far as DeSantis is where he outright bans certain ideas. Mm -hmm. well, on that note, uh, thank you very much, uh, David L. Bernstein, for joining thank the you. show. And uh, It's everyone... been great to be with you. Awesome. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Yes, uh, his book is Woke Anti-Semitism. I'm glad to have you on as a fellow defender of liberal values, and I wish you all the best with your work. Thanks a million.